Hey everybody, Jim here. We were set to have two drivers joining us this week. Unfortunately, due to some technical issues, ones that those of you watching on YouTube will no doubt notice, that wasn't possible. So there are a few points where I refer to two drivers, and that's not an error with the podcast. We sadly couldn't get the answers from our second guest. It's still another great episode anyway. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Hello and welcome to the F1 Feeder Series podcast, your guide to keeping up to date on everything in the junior single-seater world. I'm your host, Jim Kimberley, and this week we're doing one final preview for the year. At long last, W Series is kicking off for 2022, and we're going to be focusing on their upcoming season. But as always, I couldn't talk through the entire podcast by myself, so I've got a few excellent voices to join in the fun. First up, and I'm genuinely delighted to introduce this driver, somebody who basically was brought up at a racetrack, enjoyed an engineering role at Renault's F1 team, and has raced in every W Series round up until now. Hello, Sabre Cook. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you so much for having me. You're most welcome. It's really, really good to have you. You're not racing this year, but you have been obviously in W Series for a long time. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, I'm injured last season. I uh, had surgery eight weeks ago now so uh finally walking again and should be hopefully cleared in september to to get back into racing but yeah sad to miss out on uh on w series this year well at least we can talk about it a little bit uh not quite the same but we'll try our best to make it exciting and finally we have the returning appearance of an f1 feeder series editor whose year is about to get a lot more busy this weekend it's a second podcast appearance for our W Series editor, Aisha Sembi. Welcome back to the podcast. Hi, guys. Thank you for having me again. <laughs> I'm so glad to have you back, Aisha. And this weekend, very excited to get started, I imagine. Yeah, buzzing to have some, some on-track action that I can actually, you know, sink my teeth into and get writing about. So, yeah, really excited for the season to start. Aren't we all? Uh, before we get into it, a quick reminder to like, comment and subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. And if you're listening to the audio only version, please leave a review on whatever podcast platform you're using. It really does help us out. So as I said in the introduction, this is all about W Series this week. And as I also said in the introduction, you've been there since the start, Sabra. You've seen the championships growth over three years. It's necessity to start with, uh, two seasons of racing. How much of a different beast was it from early 2019 and the selection process back then until that finale last year? Yeah, I think, I mean, the first selection process was incredibly intensive. Um, it was, and it wasn't just, you know, one event that it was broken up into two different ones. So, uh, it was a lot of fun, um, even though it was, you know, a bit stressful, but it, it was really great. And we got to connect with a lot of other girls as well. Um, so, so it was awesome. And then W series, obviously, as you've seen has developed, um, over the course of, of the last three years, and they're just trying to learn, you know, how to run better. We're, we obviously moved from DTM to F1. So that changed things a little bit. Um, the format changed a tiny bit. And then at least last year, we were also had a little bit more free reign with the car setup, which was cool. Um, and yeah, just, they're just trying to, you know, push their media presence forward. And I think that the, the series brand is growing a lot. Yeah. I'm going to talk about that media presence as well, because there's been quite a few changes for this year, but we'll get onto that in a second. Aisha, I imagine most of our audience are familiar with W Series at least, but perhaps some only watched a couple of season one races, but it's changed a lot since then, hasn't it? Yeah, massively. I think, um, you know, before this podcast, I was kind of like looking at the difference between 2019, 2021 and 2022, and there have been massive changes in not just kind of the format, but like you say, the mass publicity that we're now seeing. Mm. So, you know, we've kind of got the introduction of teams, you know, regardless of whether they're just the sponsorship and identification. The fact that we've kind of got that team involvement, I think is really nice now. Um, we're racing, uh, you know, alongside Formula One. Um, I always think a nice comparison is in 2019, the UK round um, was Brands Hatch and we're now racing at Silverstone right before the F1 drivers, which I think is just such a incredible you know leap um 
and yeah, you know, I'd say, like I say, I think the main change is kind of that mass publicity that we've now got. Um, and, you know, the mass exposure. W Series has kind of gone from, you know, being this kind of new idea that, you know, captured the attention of fans within the motorsport community to now being something that absolutely everyone can get involved with and can watch and can kind of find their team and root for people. So, yeah, ma- massive changes, but like really welcome changes, I think. Yeah, welcome changes. It's not that much needed to change. It's just the presence, isn't it? It's on a bigger yeah, bigger yeah. stage now. And I still think some of the racing there is as pure as you get. No uh, artificial tricks like DRS or anything so far. So we're into 2022 now. All the drivers have been announced. It's going to be the longest season so far with 10 rounds. There's new teams, new circuits, Sky Sports coverage, and even Caitlyn Jenner has got involved. A lot to be excited for for this upcoming season, Aisha. Yeah, definitely. Um, Like I said before, I feel like 2022 is kind of going to be the biggest season the W Series has ever had. Um, And I do um, attribute that massively to this kind of mass publicity that we're seeing. Um, And like you say, we've kind of, uh, we've gone from eight rounds to 10 rounds. We're racing, um, you know, in support of Formula One Grand Prix. um, And we've got some massive names involved. Like we say, Caitlyn Jenner, not just a massive name within sports, but also a reality TV star. That's bound to bring in some new audiences. Um, And yeah, I think it's just um, really exciting in that regard to kind of have this level of exposure um, beyond motorsport communities um, and kind of introduce a new audience and show, you know, that it, it kind of beyond just motorsport as we know it, like women's motorsport, kind of showing that there can be this diverse level um, to motorsport. Yeah. I agree. So Sabra, you're recovering from an injury, so not a year that you'll be racing too much in. And I know you're friendly with the drivers. The championship speaks highly of you. So I imagine you've been close to all of the news. What are the thoughts about the upcoming season like from inside of the camp? And how much input do you drivers have for subsequent seasons? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm excited to see to see how things go this year with all the new players involved and the new drivers that are coming in and see, see what Jamie does for a third season. <laughs> So as far as input for like, as far as our input goes into forming the championship, I think they do take like some, some feedback from us, but the majority is, you know, what Catherine and Sean and Dave think is what's best going forward and what's best to grow the series. And with your involvement, you say, because you're a driver there and you mentioned earlier that you've now had the ability to change a car setup a little bit more 2021 to 2020, sorry, 2019. <laughs> it gets very confusing with that COVID year, doesn't it? But was that something that was feedback that was relayed to uh, the championship back then? Like the, the car setup was too restrictive? Yeah, I think a lot of drivers wanted to be able to play a bit more. Um, so, so that has been taken in. And then we also, I think it kind of corresponded with the fact that we were given usually one or two engineers for the season, um, except for poor Isla. She had like four or five different engineers throughout the season, but um, everybody else usually stuck with one or two. Uh, so then having that you know relationship that you could build on throughout the season and play a bit more with all those different setups uh, was definitely something that was new in 2021. With those sorts of things, which aren't necessarily as visible to us, who just tune in uh, I know Aisha and I have got a bit more involvement with some regards with the media but a lot of people tune in every week or every however often it's on and they just see the same cars but behind the scenes that's not the case I know you were swapping chassis back in 2019 which I don't think was necessarily the same in 2021 how much of an impact does that have for you as a driver going through the season having some consistency yeah, we still did change the power units though, but it was good to at least, you know, have the have the consistent chassis and it made it easier on the guys too, right? So they didn't have to rewrap the cars every single race. So um, I think they enjoyed that probably a little bit, but it was, uh, yeah, I mean, it was honestly, like as a racing driver, you're just supposed to adapt to whatever you're given. So yes, I guess it was nice having the consistency and not having to, you know, readjust your fitment in the car every time you get a new, new car that weekend. But other than that, it wasn't terribly different, I guess, because you're you're. It's always going to be something different. The conditions are always going to be different. The track's always going to be different. So in that regard, it was always just get in and adapt to whatever you had. Yeah, adapting to that rainy spa weekend must have been very difficult. <laughs> Another season this year as well, Sabra. Uh, joining F1, 
for even longer than before, going to 10 rounds, eight different locations. How much of a connection did you feel with F1 last year? I know there's some bubbles and so on, but did you feel that you were on the F1 weekend and everything was just amped up compared to 2019? Yeah, you could definitely tell you were on the F1 weekend. Everything is a little more strict and a little more you're kept in your own bubble. Um, but it was cool to be there and be a part of like that experience and that like those demographics that got exposed to W Series. I think it was great the fact that you know we got to be in front of them. Um, so it was it was cool. It you know a different kind of energy than DTM. Um, but I at the end of the day, it's I mean it's great to be on a racetrack. Period. But it it was neat to to have that little niche. Of, uh, of being with F1. I did hear from somebody that they said when you're on the F1 calendar, it's when that's it's when these circuits look the best. Because when you're a feeder series driver, you go and visit Brands Hatch, you go and visit places in the States, like you go to Watkins Glen and stuff. But when you're to a racetrack when F1's just been on, Razzmatazz, there's, everything's been painted new. Did you feel that from, you say, your DTM season, the difference with just F1 putting on a show? I mean, DTM still does an amazing job. They still clean up. Everything is, you know, everything still looks great. But I think F1 definitely does take it to a new level. Um, there's, I mean, there's a lot bigger budgets involved. So obviously it makes it easier for them to do that. And I mean, you're seeing in Miami, they're putting fake marina and water in. So that's like the level of of things that they can do. And it definitely, they, they're always like repainting the curbs, repainting the side barriers, like on the days when you're doing your track walk, because they want to make sure everything looks, you know, absolutely perfect for TV. Um, so yeah, it is, it is a, a different level. I do love going to an F1 race. It's like nothing else. You mentioned Miami there and I sure, and well, everybody, let me just go through the calendar quickly because I thought last year's calendar was pretty good, but this year's calendar is exceptional, I would say. So Miami, we don't know so far, two rounds to open it in Miami. We don't know what the track is like, but as a location, spectacular. Barcelona, Silverstone, uh, going off to Paul Ricard, Hungaroring, Suzuka, Circuit of Americas again, and then a double header, which we didn't get last time, but a double header at Mexico City to round out the season just before the end of October. Pretty good calendar, Aisha. Yeah, um, no, definitely. I um, I mean, I'm personally really excited for Hungary and Silverstone, but that's just because I've got weekend tickets. So <laughs> I'm really excited to see the cars in action. Um, but no, like you said, I feel like they've really... That the calendar this year is so so exciting. I'm really looking forward to Miami, just because I think having a new track is always brill. Um, it's just that excitement of we don't know what it's going to be like, and I think that always just makes it a lot more exciting as a spectator. Um, and Suzuka, I think that will be absolutely brilliant for W Series. Um, yeah, in all honesty, I think um, given that there's you know ten rounds, uh, eight circuits, like it's obviously not the same length as a Formula One World Championship, for example, but that kind of extension um, in support of those races and those race weekends. Um, I think, like you said, Sabre, it just kind of like really amps up W Series as a championship in itself. And I think it's 2022 is just going to be absolutely massive. Um, and like we say, you know, kind of kicking off in Miami in this new circuit, I think that's going to be absolutely brilliant. Um, yeah, sorry, long-winded answer. I'm excited for all of it. Good answer. I do like uh, I do like the Hungary as well. I've been there. Great track to go to. Sabre, when we spoke last year, I know you were very excited to go to Spa, and you're not going to be racing on these tracks. But any of those a stand out from a driver's perspective for you? If you were going onto a, a sister calendar or something? Um, I mean, Suzuka would be cool because I've never raced in that part of the world. Um, it has a lot of great history, so that would be pretty awesome. Um, but as far as the others, I mean, my, Miami is a new track, so it would be interesting. And, and I do enjoy street courses. So I think that would be fun as well. Um, Mexico, I would really, I would really like to do too. The, the Mexican fans are super, they're awesome. They like, they would give you their house if they could, cause they're just like so excited that, that you're there. And, um, so I think those ones would probably be standouts for me. Yeah, that last section. I was fortunate enough to be there for the Formula E in, in that grandstand right at the end. I've done a lot of F1 races, but I've never been in a grandstand, anything like that. It was something else. So being a driver driving through it would be uh, exceptional. 
Let's talk a little bit about the future as well. Sabra, are you hoping to find a way back into W Series in the future, or are you looking to explore other opportunities? Uh, so for me, I'm looking to explore other opportunities. Um, I think W Series is great, and it's got a lot of more exposure for women in motorsports, but um, ideally my, my goal is to move on to other championships that are you know, fully, fully integrated with men. And with regards to that, you've done some road to Indy side of things. I know you've been racing, was it Mazda's last year as well? Do you have anything in the pipeline at the moment or is your injury just preventing you to get those sorts of deals made right now? Uh, no, definitely tons of things in the pipeline. I was actually supposed to be running in a different championship this year, but that quickly changed when I had to have surgery. Hmm. So uh, hopefully making an announcement in August or September. And the recovery, uh, we obviously wish you well. What's the sort of length that you're talking about from when you are going to be fully recovered? And also just for the people who don't know, you were racing last year with an injury. Can you talk a little bit about the injury you sustained and how it was impacting your last year? Yeah, it was not fun at all. <laughs> I'll, I'll be completely honest. Like if you watch uh, like pretty much every one of my post-race interviews is like, how are you feeling? And I'm like, I'm in a lot of pain. <laughs> like, so it wasn't the best. Um, but I, yeah, so I got injured at Red Bull one. So then raced the rest of the season with that injury. And, uh, so it was compressed L1, L2, herniated L5, spinal canal narrowing, SI joint damage, right hip labrum tear. And then my femur was no longer sitting correctly in my hip joint. So when they went in to do the labrum repair, which is why this, why I had surgery on my hip, they had to, they dislocate your femur, they grind off bone on the inside of your hip, and they grind off the top of your feet, the ball of your femur, and they push it back together and then they stitch the labrum back up. So, so I was, yeah, I was, I was having a rough go. Um, I couldn't even get out of the car after Budapest. Like it was, it was bad. Um, but I survived through the series and, uh, I'm, I'm going to be fully rehabbed hopefully, um, by beginning of September. And I have moved to Indianapolis now, and there's some amazing medical power here. Like it is unreal or ortho Indy, which a lot of drivers go to, um, has they did my surgery and I, I, I come from a small town, love them. I know they're great, but like the amount of the, the, they're just amazing. Like it was completely next level. And the way they walk you through it, it's just, it was, it made me feel like it was a lot easier on body and everything. So, and, uh, I I've been, I've had a lot of great support here. So I am, I'm looking forward to coming back stronger than before. Sabra. So, it might surprise you to know that I'm not a doctor, but going at 200 kilometers an hour with that sort of injury sounds like the worst thing you could do. Were you, were you not tempted to bring it up last year? Yeah, no, I did. Um, I like, I did say, like, I was not super vocal about it, I guess, because I was trying to just stay focused on what I was doing and I couldn't change it at that time. And I actually didn't, I knew something was wrong but we didn't know exactly what it was. Um, so that I had the, the physios that travel with W series were absolutely amazing. Like they, they kept me together through the season. Um, and I, I learned pretty much every recovery trick in the book. So if anyone has any questions, <laughs> I'm for, I will definitely share everything that I learned. Uh, but yeah, it was, it wasn't great. Um, and it's always so weird as an athlete to, it's kind of weird to share the injury because you feel like it's a bit taboo and you're not really sure how you can talk about it. So at the time, I, yeah, I, I didn't, I wasn't as vocal as I probably should have been. Cause I, I think in my mind, I was like, I can't change it right now. I just have to keep focused on what I can control and what I can do. And then, yeah, after, after then I tackled the whole, the whole monster. Well, yeah, much, much applause to you for getting through it in some of your races. Yeah, I should give you applause for anybody listening. That was, yeah, it sounds awful. So I'm automatically going to add 10 places to every single one of your positions, which might have put you right at the championship front, if not for uh, that injury, because it sounds just disgusting. Oh, uh, I'll shake that off um, and go to a tough question for you, Aisha, because one criticism that we one criticism that we have seen is the lack of progression from W so far. Jamie has won twice. 
got prize money twice, said she wasn't going to come back for 2022, yet here we are. She's returning double champion now. I can't imagine Oscar Piastri, apart from the rules, winning Formula 2 twice, and again, I'll just do it again. I couldn't imagine Dennis Hauger winning Formula 3 twice, thinking I'll do it again. Usually you'd want to see some sort of progression. What can W do to continue the progression of its drivers or are other championships not viewing as it as a viable source for talent yeah i do kind of want to like preface this answer by saying that like i am such a massive proponent of w series i think it's an absolutely brilliant championship and i think its mission and what it's doing for like exposure is absolutely unmatched um in regard to like gender diversity and diversity as a whole within motorsport i think it's doing an absolutely brilliant job but like you say, um, the kind of like, I suppose, like phrase I always use when talking about this is at this point, if Jamie Chadwick can't progress beyond W Series, who can? And by that, I mean, like you say, she is the only champion of the series since it started in 2019. Back to back championships. Um, I believe it's a million dollars accumulated in prize funds. Um, backing from Williams Formula One team. You know, it really should be this kind of perfect recipe for progression into um, at least Formula Regional or FIA F3. Um, and it's just not happening. And um, as W Series is kind of like going on and progressing year by year, I feel like the lack of progression is presenting a real problem or like a fundamental issue that I think needs to be addressed as soon as possible. Um because, yeah, it's like we say, I think I don't think Jamie Chadwick has anything more to prove. I think if you've won back-to-back championships um, and you win races with ease, um, there really isn't any reason to kind of not progress. Um, and to kind of answer, you know, the question of what more can W Series do or, like, what more can other championships do to acknowledge W Series, I always think that the primary issue isn't W Series or women in motorsport or, you know, this idea that women aren't good enough or W Series isn't good enough. For me, it's kind of the funding in ascending the feed series ladder. I always say, you know, if we use Jamie Chadwick, Chadwick as an example, if she can't get to the next step with a million dollars, maybe something should change there. Like she said herself in the last time we spoke that the average seat costs between two and three million dollars in FIA F3. Um, yeah, I think, you know, it kind of opens up a wider conversation of no wonder motorsport is so... Um, elitist no wonder it's so difficult to get in when you know money is the kind of primary reason primary factor holding so many drivers back as each season goes on they kind of need to find an answer for this lack of progression because otherwise it does risk kind of just becoming where girls race um, which I'd absolutely hate for it to become I think you raise a lot of valid points there I know Sabre you're nodding on especially with the funding issues as well it sounds like the problems- I actually Sorry, I have a number that's going to make you really sad. So 99.6% of sports sponsorship a year goes to men. 0.4% goes to women. And you say sports sponsorship, not motorsports sponsorship, sports sponsorship. Sports sponsorship globally. So like including motorsports, that's the number. Yeah, that's a bit of a horrifying figure. And the thing for me as well, not that the podcast host will have all these opinions, but the thing for me is of all the sports you have in the world, because let's be frank, there are physical differences between men and women. That's just biology. But the point of motorsport is the biology is taken out of it. You can do some strength training, right? But if your engine's 700 horsepower and somebody else's engine's 700 horsepower, it doesn't matter the gender that's sitting inside of the car and the cockpit. So for me, it's a really baffling situation how I know know there's a lot of problems and I can go into a whole podcast like you say, Aisha, about talking this in detail about the opportunity, right? That's the biggest problem is having the opportunity to jump in there. So if you've got a net of 100 female carters age 10, but then you've got a net of 2,500 male carters, the chances are you're going to find some better drivers who are men because your pool is so much bigger. So evening that out, which is, let's be frank, the idea of what W Series is for, that's hugely the whole point of the series to inspire young people that maybe we're not going to get Jamie Chadwick to be the next Lewis Hamilton, but maybe somebody like Lola or Lola, who's somebody like Lola five years younger, could be the champion in a while because 
an 11 year old who might have thought racing's not for me because all they've seen is Lewis Hamilton winning races, Max Verstappen winning races, but then they tune in and then they see somebody like Jamie Chadwick and Alice Powell and Abby Pulling getting pole positions and winning races. That's the whole inspiration. Now, as much as we could ask questions all day, F1 Feeder Series isn't for us, it's for you. And we want to make sure you all feel involved. So we're moving on to the part of the podcast where our viewers and listeners have their say with hashtag AskF1FS. If this is your first time watching or listening, you can get involved by using the hashtag AskF1FS on Twitter, joining our Discord and using the podcast questions channel, or simply commenting on our YouTube videos and asking whatever it is that's on your mind. First up, we've got a question here, which I'm sure you two are very used to answering, but how did you get into racing? Let's go with you first, Sabra. So my dad used to race motocross and supercross professionally in the 80s. And he and my mother did not want my brother and I racing motorcycles. So we got into karting uh, at a young age. With that karting, am I right in saying from our previous conversations, you were essentially brought up at the racetrack, right? Yeah, yeah. My uh, my father and uncle and grandfather and an investor were like, wow, we're going to build a karting track. It's going to make so much money and blah. Little did they know, and <laughs> that's not how it works. And then, so they built a karting track in 2001, and I just, yeah, grew up running around there and uh, playing in the dirt like any other kid. Want to give a little shout out to uh, Grand Junction Motor Speedway? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, it's Grand Junction Motor Speedway is the one where I grew up um, and is still family owned. The the property is. But now we actually have a new owner that has come in and taken over the courting business. And he's great. He's trying to expand it. So uh, I definitely recommend going out and checking it out. And if you're really lucky, you can spot Sabre driving around the karting track in a car with a dog in the passenger seat from some of the anecdotes that I've <laughs> I've heard. Um this question's from Adzi via Discord and wants to know, as drivers who are both involved with W Series in some way, do you think there's a place for the W Series feeder series, that's a bit of a mouthful, that is being proposed by the organizers alongside the main series? Let's go with you, Sabre, for this one first. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, F3 is already at a certain level. So if there's nothing, you know, building that development to get into F3, uh, I think that, that there is a need for that. And it's almost like having a driver development program to then get into F3 or like how Williams has their driver development program and Mercedes and at Ferrari and Renault, like it's basically the same, same idea, more or less, I think it's just getting more seats available that are specifically um, aimed toward females. So just getting people into a car from a cart is generally the, the target, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. This question comes from Foss King via Discord. Do the two drivers feel they've been helped more because of the effort to get more women into racing? Presumably they were some of the only girls in their respective karting series and they both graduate to single seaters. Now this is a bit of a loaded question, I guess, Sabra, because we've already spoken about the disadvantages that, that women have. Do you think that what I suspect they're saying is that you're also you have more eyeballs on you when you're younger because you're trying to beat the guys? Yeah, I mean, definitely people like to know, usually before W Series happened, you know, with Danica or Lynn or whoever else, who won the race and where did the girl finish? Like, <laughs> that's what people looked for, honestly. And so I think that you did have a lot of eyes on you when you're, only, you're the only girl and it, it's normal. You know, that's a normal thing. You're usually the only one on the grid. But then... I think W Series has been good at bringing it overall awareness of women in, present in the sport, because even though we were the only one, and yes, maybe we got way more attention because we were the only girl, it still wasn't translating to equal amount of sponsorship dollars. Like, uh -huh. even though I won a race, it still wasn't translating to the same, the equal amount of sponsorship dollars that a guy gets when he wins a race, like to, to go to the next thing. So I think it, it's done more, more good than anything else just to, bring more awareness as a whole to to the cause of women trying to go forward in motorsports hell we're having the conversation now right that's that's a good point whereas five ten years ago it wouldn't even be, be brought up for whether you have good opinions or bad opinions so a very good point um 
This question comes from Will Jones, who wants to know, do you believe W Series has achieved what it's set out to do and is positive for women in motorsport? He believes it has increased awareness and helped, but how do you feel about arguments surrounding its segregation of female drivers from male drivers? Let's go with you again, Sabre, first. Uh, that is a tough question. Isn't it? <laughs> so, I mean, yes, they have increased the awareness of women in motorsports, and that has been amazing. But as far as translating that into getting into higher levels, we haven't seen that yet. Because as you mentioned earlier, Jamie has won it twice and she's coming back for a third year. So it would be really awesome to see her be able to move forward um, in the next season or maybe even run something else later this year alongside W Series. Um, who was the second part of the question? Second part of the question is about the segregation elements between male and female. Okay. Um, I think that, yes, we never, you never want to be separated. You want, always want to be racing in the top championship with the best drivers, because when you're racing with the best, you're going to be challenged more. You're going to learn more. Um, so in that respect, I, I do, that's why I like racing in, you know, normal championships, but with W series, yes, it's, it takes women away from being racing with men. But it also gives us a platform where we don't have to bring sponsorship. We don't have to worry about the funding. We get seat time and we get a chance to make connections, build our brand. So it's, it's you know, it's pros and cons, right? Like I, as a driver, having a championship that you can go race in that is fully funded and you can go be on one of the biggest stages in the world alongside F1, for me, that feels like a lot more pros than cons. Uh -huh. so as a racing driver, I would always, I would never not choose to, to go that route. So I, I agree with Sabra in my answer in that I think W Series has done absolute wonders for um, visibility for women in motorsport. Um, but, you know, if the kind of mission of the championship is to propel women into the highest levels of motorsport, i.e. Formula One, or at least FIA, F2 and F3, um, it just hasn't delivered on that just yet. Um, so, you know, like whenever the question is asked, is W Series doing a good job? My answer is always yes, but because, you know, yes, in the sense that it's doing wonders for publicity and people now know that there's a women's championship and women do drive and, wow, you know, so diverse, you know, that it's kind of got the narrative going, which I think is an amazing start. Um but yeah, like I say, the kind of purpose of it and mission of it is to advance, sorry, is to build on that. Um, I think the next step is to really work on delivery of that mission. Um, so not just kind of saying, you know, we're inspiring the next generation, you know, and take it one step further, you know, show them that there is room for progression, not just that they can race, that they can race at the top flights of motorsport. Just to answer the um, second bit on, you know, segregation of um, the genders. Um, I find this really interesting because I was talking to someone literally yesterday who said that, you know, there should be like W1 and W2 and W3 and kind of like a women's championship. I personally think I'm against that because the one thing I really don't want W Series to become is like F1 for girls. Um, like Sabre's already said, you know, we kind of, I was, I'll say normal championships, but like mixed gender championships, that's kind of where the main publicity, main attention, et cetera, is on. Um, and that is kind of like the pinnacle of motorsport. And it's not men's motorsport, technically. It's just motorsport. Like you said earlier, motorsport is one of the only sports where, you know, gender doesn't really play a massive biological role in, you know, are men going to be faster? Are men going to be stronger? Like um, I interviewed Chloe Chambers recently and she put it simply how, she said that the car doesn't see your race, your gender, your sexuality, it doesn't see any of that. Um, and I think it would be a shame taking that into account to have a women's only series, a uh, champion, no, a women's only series, I guess. Because um, it does kind of, you know, reinforce that notion that women aren't as good and they need their own little side series um, to prove themselves. As for now, I think W Series is necessary as a segregated championship, but I don't think building on that and kind of building more segregated championships is going to do anyone any good. 
Um, like we've said so far, it you know gives girls um, track time. It gives girls exposure. It kind of, like I said before, kind of brings in that narrative that girls can do this. Um, but the next step is kind of propelling them into motorsport as a whole. Um, yeah, I just think, you know, if we kind of continue segregating, then it will just become F1 for girls. And, you know, we don't want F1 for girls. We want girls in F1. Um, so, yeah, I suppose the short answer is segregation of the genders is good for now to kind of build on that exposure. But what we really want is to kind of eliminate that segregation at one point and kind of force integration wherever we can. Finally, you have this question from CM Parfait 16, a little bit more of a easygoing question. You'll be happy to hear drivers. What are your favorite racing games up to now and why? Um, I used to play like SSX Tricky where the snowboard and like a uh, skiing game, like when I was a kid, I haven't played it like, I don't even know how long, but I used to love that as a kid. And also um, like the motocross race i can't even remember what the name of the game was but i would it's always like this uh, two wheels isn't it for you yeah it was but that was when i was a kid and then like as i got older um then I, obviously i racing is what we what we mostly use or a set of courses so that is that is primarily and it's more like it's always more sim focused right it's not really like i'm gonna go play a racing game i mean i play mario kart sometimes <laughs> i'm not that good at it but i do my best <laughs> It doesn't make sense in my head sometimes. I'm like, this is not right. Like, this is not work in the real world, but it's just what you got to do to win the game. So, is it, is it the point when you turn into a massive bullet that goes around the, the screen? You think this isn't realistic? That and like the fact that you go faster if you drift. <laughs> that's not real life. <laughs> you don't get a boost in real life afterwards. <laughs> no. So, I also, fun fact, people always find it funny that I'm a motorsport journalist, but I like can't drive at all. Like I can't drive like a regular car. I can barely ride my bike. I'm not very good at racing or racing games or anything along those lines. Um, but yeah, when I was younger, um, it was always Gran Turismo for me on the PlayStation 2. Um, it was always as well, um, MotoGP. I don't know why. I was really obsessed with like bike racing, Valentino Rossi. Um, I don't know if anyone has like older siblings, but my older brother would always do the thing where he'd be playing and then he would just like hand me a remote and I'd be sat there like, oh my God, I'm Valentino Rossi. I'm the best. Um, so yeah, those are my memories of, <laughs> of like uh, video games. Um, I recently tried my hand at F1 2021. Not very good at it, um, but I like the, you know, I think it's the first F1 game where you can kind of make your own team and like, do a little career mode there. I think that's a bit where I thrive because as I've already said, driving, not for me. Team management, maybe. Choosing cool liveries, that's where I thrive. <laughs> the delivery designer, F1 delivery yeah. designer. <laughs> I'm most disappointed about personally that nobody picked up on uh, Burnout Free Takedown, which I believe is genuinely the race racing game ever. It encourages you to crash, not that... I'm good at crashing, but it's a great, great game for the Xbox 360, maybe even the original Xbox, wow. But anyway, let's call it quits there. Some good games brought up. So thank you so much to CM Parfait 16 again for your regular questions and a brilliant one there. Thank you everybody else for listening. That's all the time we have this week. If you'd like to have your question asked on a future episode, use the hashtag, hashtag AskF1FS on Twitter. Drop any questions below if you're watching on YouTube or let us know the questions you have on your mind on our Discord. Look for the podcast questions channel. And if you are watching on YouTube, dropping a like on the video, leaving a comment and subscribing to the channel all really helps us. If you're listening, leaving a review on the podcast platform you're listening on is greatly appreciated. Finally, check out f1feederseries.com for more feeder series insight and follow F1 Feeder Series 1, F1 FS Americas and F1 FS Live on Twitter. You can find the links to all of those plus the Twitter accounts for myself and everyone else on the podcast in the YouTube description or the podcast show notes. Until next time, we have been the F1 Feeder Series podcast. Goodbye.